Welcome to the Market Pulse podcast from Equifax, where we break down the latest economic and credit insights to help you navigate today's business landscape. Hello, and welcome to the Market Pulse podcast from Equifax. I'm Brandi Recker, an analytic advisor in higher education here at Equifax, and I will be hosting today's episode on the challenges around post-secondary education. We've all seen the news headlines, and chances are you've experienced firsthand the unprecedented issues swirling around post-secondary education. An increasing number of students and parents are asking themselves, is a college education worth the hefty price tag? And that's just the beginning. Colleges and universities are seeing declining enrollment rates, affordability concerns, mounting regulatory pressure, the resumption of student loan payments, and now the reversal of affirmative action in admissions. I'm joined today by Lori Lindenberg, District Director of Enterprise Analytics and Strategy at Maricopa Community Colleges. We will be discussing some of the macro industry challenges, including pressure to prove the ROI of a college degree and what Maricopa is doing to address it while delivering on their student-first mission. But before we start our conversation, David Fieldhouse, Director of Predictive Analytics at Moody's Analytics, will set the stage with a quick overview on the economics behind these challenges. David? There is currently $1.8 trillion of student debt outstanding. In terms of federal student loan debt, there are are about 44 million federal borrowers who owe around $38,000 each. The distribution of student debt is highly skewed, though. The top 10% of borrowers account for approximately 45% of total debt, while the bottom 50% of borrowers account for around 10% of student loan debt. It is worth noting that half of student loan borrowers owe less than $20,000, and debt levels above $40,000 are a bit rarer and typically concentrated amongst individuals over 25 years of age, suggesting that this debt is more associated with some type of graduate degree. The graduation rates for students remain relatively low. Less than two-thirds of individuals receive their bachelor's degree within six years of starting college, and it's important to note that the graduation rates vary significantly depending on the selectivity of the institution. The most selective institutions tend to have the highest graduation rates. For institutions that accept less than a quarter of individuals, the graduation rate is above 90%. However, the graduation rate drops to nearly 28% for institutions with open admission policies. Furthermore, graduation rates vary considerably by race. The reversal of affirmative action policies could result in more Asian students being accepted and fewer Black students. Uh, Asian Americans have a graduation rate of 77%, that's the highest, and while African Americans graduate at rates closer to 45%. The recent announcement of SAVE, that's President Biden's income-driven repayment policy, is going to make significant changes to federal student loans. Eligible borrowers can lower the monthly bills and reduce the amount they pay back over the lifetime of their loans. We expect the SAVE plan's macroeconomic impact to be small in the short to medium term. The SAVE plan is targeted and will be will primarily benefit lower income borrowers responsible for a relatively small share of aggregate spending. And while there are Political and legal challenges, if the plan is fully implemented next year, some borrowers may see their monthly bills cut in half, with the remaining debt canceled after making at least 10 years of payments. The plan also introduces changes such as an increased protected income threshold, a limit on interest accrual, lower payments for married borrowers who file taxes separately, an automatic recertification based on tax return information, and there will also be automatic enrollment for borrowers that are struggling on their payments. Debt forgiveness has the potential to increase household net worth, leading to a positive wealth effect, and subsequently boosting consumer spending. Ultimately, this should have a positive impact on GDP, although we believe it to be fairly modest given the targeted nature of the program. On the other hand, it's important to consider the consequences of debt forgiveness on interest rates. Uh, An increase in federal government debt resulting from debt forgiveness can put upward pressure on interest rates. Higher debt levels may lead to concerns about the government's ability to repay its obligations, leading to a higher perceived risk and demand for higher interest rates on government bonds. Furthermore, taxes may increase as well. Ultimately, the cost to the taxpayers will be spread over many years, though. There are also moral hazard risks associated with debt forgiveness. If individuals expect future debt forgiveness, they may be more inclined to take on higher debt levels, assuming it will be forgiven. This behavior can create an incentive for irresponsible borrowing and lending practices. 
Finally, there is a concern that debt forgiveness could be inflationary in the long run if debt forgiveness reduces the incentives for higher education institutions to control tuition and costs and may contribute to rising tuition fees. Thanks, David. Lori, welcome to the show. I'm so happy to have you here today. Thanks, Brandy. Happy to be here. Before we dive into today's topic, tell us a little bit more about Maricopa Community College and your role there. Yeah, absolutely. So I am the District Director of Enterprise Analytics and Strategy, and I run a team, lead a team of data professionals at our district office that provide services related to data visualization, research, and other analytics support for our community college district. We're a large district of 10 colleges across the Phoenix metro area. We have about 140,000 students. Nine out of 10 of those colleges are Hispanic-serving institutions, and we're the number one provider of higher education to students of color in the state of Arizona. We also have uh, just redeveloped our mission statement at Maricopa. So our mission is to ignite talent, transform lives, and enrich communities through teaching, learning, and service. So we're very passionate about transforming lives in the way of giving students the opportunity for gainful employment after they complete with us. We conducted a a study of the economic impact of Maricopa Community Colleges and found that we contribute almost $7 billion to the local economy. And one out of every 27 jobs in Maricopa County is supported by the work of our colleges and our students. That's awesome. Can you tell us more about Maricopa's mission to reduce wage inequality for minority groups? Are there any specific examples or initiatives that you can share with us? We've acknowledged that there is some work to do related to how well our students are doing after completion in their wage outcomes. We're proud of the fact that the median wage for our students is a livable wage, but we do acknowledge that there is some challenges within that. We found equity gaps in our wage outcomes, anywhere from seven dollars to $8,000 a year difference for our minority graduates compared to our non-minority graduates, and one dollars to 2000 difference for our first-generation graduates. We've also worked with some external partners to do some research in the Phoenix metropolitan area and have found that the highest wage occupations in our economy have the least diverse workforce. And the flip is also true where the lowest wage occupations have the most diverse workforce. And I think Maricopa sees ourselves as an organization that can help solve that problem. A couple of things that we've done to try to address this, we've been trying to create more intentional short-term programs that lead to high wage opportunities. So an example of this that's gotten a lot of great attention is our semiconductor boot camp, which is a really short-term program, but it produces an opportunity to earn $20 to $25 an hour in an entry-level job. And the average wage is actually $62,000 a year for someone with experience in that area. So um, there's more opportunities than just that one, but I wanted to highlight that one as as one of those stellar short-term programs that helps a student get in, get out quickly, and earn gainful employment. We've also really focused on helping students understand the opportunities that they have to earn a high wage upon completion. And so um, we're working with our students even prior to them entering our programs in Maricopa so that they understand what that path would look like. They can evaluate their interests and pick something that really aligns with their passions, but they also know what the wage potential of that occupational area. And so a couple of things that we're doing related to that, we have a partnership with Pipeline AZ. Um, The Maricopa Pipeline AZ platform is technology that helps a student do that career assessment and analysis of their interests aligned with wage outcomes. And then we really build on this with our first year experience course that we just implemented last fall. And in that course, students go through an interest assessment. They uh, explore jobs that sound interesting to them. And we've had a couple of really exciting anecdotes come out of that experience with our students. Um, For example, students just not realizing that their passions actually exist in the world as an occupation and that Maricopa offers a program to help get them there. Um, A couple examples of this are our music therapy program and our veterinary technician program, where students realize that that could be an option for them and that Maricopa had programs that would help them achieve that outcome as their job. And the other things that we're doing really have to do with making sure that all of our students um, of whatever background feel a sense of belonging in our programs and that they see themselves in who's teaching them and who's working at the schools just in our diverse workforce. Wow. It sounds like you have a number of initiatives and programs that are really working to address wage inequality for minority groups. 
Lori, when you were talking earlier about Maricopa's mission, you also touched on affordability. We do know that this is a rising concern for prospective students and their parents, especially during a challenging economy. Think about it. In 1980, the price to attend a four-year college full-time was $10,231 annually. And that included tuition, fees, room and board, and was adjusted for inflation, according to the National Center for Education Statistics. By 2019 to 2020, the total price has increased to $28,775. That represents a 180% increase. How is Maricopa impacted by these affordability concerns, and what steps do you guys have in place to address this very real and valid issue? Great question, Brandy. We recognize that the cost of going to college is a real concern. Um, In fact, we found that 18% of our incoming prospective students have chosen not to enroll with us because they're concerned about the cost of coming to college. And it's even higher when we look at our underserved students at 23%. However, I think that the two-year institutions in Arizona have done a particularly good job of keeping costs low. So even with a recent modest increase uh, to our tuition rates at our colleges, across Arizona, two-year institutions have been able to keep this low at nearly $500 lower than the national average when you look at the net tuition revenue per student. So we're really proud of our ability to do that, and it's been something that we've really prioritized and been committed to. We also are really encouraged by some recent changes to what we're allowed to do for our students. So a recent bill passed that allows us the opportunity to offer in-state tuition to our undocumented students. And also another bill passed um, in our recent legislative session that is allowing us to discount student tuition for dual enrollment students who are low income. So I think through those opportunities, we can get creative about offering students at that lowest cost option in our in our tuition. Another thing that's great about where we're currently at with our tuition rates is that for Pell eligible students, their grants completely cover their tuition and their fees most of the time. So they're not leaving us with a whole lot of burden from student loan debt. And then in d- addition to keeping all of these costs low, we also are committed to helping our students find financial support when they do need it. We have a lot of scholarship opportunities and we have a really active foundation that's associated with our district. To stay competitive, schools must be able to prove the payoff from such a significant investment. On top of that, there is mounting regulatory pressure for higher education institutions to prove the ROI of a college degree. For example, we've seen that Ohio House Bill 27 requires that in-state post-secondary schools provide financial costs and aid disclosure as well as the income range of similar cohorts of students providing greater transparency to students around the anticipated cost and resulting value of a degree. Does the industry anticipate similar regulations coming from other states? And what is Maricopa doing to navigate this landscape? I think we are expecting increased pressure. However, it's not new. Uh, We are already getting that kind of pressure from external partners and related to some funding sources. So, for example, we receive funding for specific programs through the Workforce Innovation and Opportunity Act. We refer to that as WIOA. And this is one of the ways that we have really benefited the most from Equifax in helping us report to the uh, reporting requirements through these funding sources. So for example, um, WIOA requires that we provide second quarter and fourth quarter wages for students participating in those programs. And we've used Equifax's tool to match to our student records and provide that data. But really any external partner that we're working with um, is expecting us to report out job placement and wage outcomes on our students. They want to see how their investment is resulting in a return for the students. I know that you're very forward thinking in your analytics and reporting, and I also know that schools have a very heavy reporting burden between accreditation, national education data collection programs, and governing board reports. What are some of the enablers that you rely on to really drive efficiency and accuracy in your reporting? This has probably been the biggest change for us over the last five years. So we have started to rely heavily on data visualization tools and modern data infrastructure. And really, we've done that to improve automation and the speed that we can do internal and external reporting. So we've moved away from legacy data warehouses. We're using an AWS data lake. We also work really closely with other technology and student service teams to make sure that we're capturing student interactions wherever we can 
so that we can measure the return on the investment that we're making in those activities. Um, And we've also put a lot of effort behind qualitative data capture. We've benefited a lot from that. However, what I will say is we used to rely entirely on that qualitative student survey data capture to monitor postgraduate outcomes. And we'd struggle with response rates, particularly with a student population who had completed and moved on. And so we never felt like we had the whole picture. We are now using Equifax to capture that data in a quantitative fashion. And we feel like that fills in that gap and really allows us to see that whole picture on our students. Um, And also because it's student role level data, we can tie it back to any additional fields that we need so that we can be flexible and run any analysis that we need to and be responsive to both internal and external audiences that are asking for us to monitor those metrics. Lori, it's been really great working with you and the Equifax data to help drive the efficiency and accuracy in your reporting. And I really appreciate your thoughtful perspective on these challenges and how Maricopa is applying a data-driven approach to further your mission. Before we wrap, I do have to ask you about the end of student loan forbearance program. We know that student loan repayments will start again in October following a three-year pause. And the Equifax data tells us that there are 43 million student loan borrowers with almost $1.5 trillion in federal student loan debt. Experts are forecasting a 17% jump in monthly debt commitments. How are you thinking about the effects of this on graduate financial outcomes? And what could it mean to Maricopa's efforts to prove ROI and maintain future affordability for students? Well, this is a difficult question, primarily because we just haven't been faced with this before. And like a lot of things that came out of the COVID-19 pandemic, this is just uncharted territory. What I will say is that we are very fortunate to have low tuition Um, Like I mentioned before, if a student is eligible for Pell Grants, most of the time they're going to have all their costs covered. So often we have students who have relied on financial aid but have been able to cover all of their costs with grants. However, cohort default rates is still something that we track very closely. We've had a couple colleges close to that limit previously, and we've put a lot of work in place in partnership with external uh, organizations that specialize in working with students who are close to defaulting on their loan repayment, as well as just kind of changing our own internal work to make sure that students understand their requirements related to repayment and um, are ready to to meet those requirements. The other thing that I will say is that we had students who stopped out when the pandemic hit. And I think part of the pause on loan repayment was it a recognition that students needed time to take care of everything that was going on in their lives during the pandemic. And now it might be time for them to return. And the restart of the repayment cycle might be that nudge to bring students back to re-enroll and finish what they started. Their repayment would freeze again because they'd be actively working on their education. And then we'd work with them to get them across the finish line and relying on our guided pathways framework to make sure that they felt like they knew that they were on track and could um, complete their degree and certificate with us. Lori, thank you again so much for joining us today. These are all very hot topics that I know many across the education ecosystem are thinking about. If our audience would like to follow up with you, where can they find you? Yeah, absolutely. And I just want to say we take all of this very seriously, which is why we've made the investment in using the Equifax tools. And we've we've benefited greatly from having that additional perspective. I welcome folks to follow up with me. You can find me on LinkedIn or you can email me at lori.lindenberg at domail.maricopa.edu. Great. We'll be sure to put your email address in the show notes if anyone is looking to get in touch with you. If you enjoyed today's episode, tell your colleagues about us and subscribe to tune into future episodes. You can learn more about the impact of student loan repayments by listening to the replay of our August 17th Market Pulse webinar, which can be found at equifax.com forward slash Market Pulse. Our team of experts works hard to provide relevant economic, credit, and industry insights to help your organization make more confident decisions and build resilience to help you focus on forward. Thank you for listening. The information and opinions provided in this podcast are intended as general guidance only and are subject to change without notice. The views presented during the podcast are those of the presenter as of the date this podcast was recorded and do not necessarily reflect official positions of Equifax. Investor analysts should direct inquiries using the contact us box on the investor relations section at Equifax.com.